I am Groot, which for those of you that don't speak Groot, translates to strap in. We're diving into the creative and cosmic world of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. It's honestly hard to believe the superhero renaissance we're in. Superhero movies, television series, even comic books are experiencing a massive high. Well, except for the X-Men. You know, the, the X-Men is still impenetrable nonsense, but you know, what else is new? The MCU has me excited about an Eternals movie, which was on no one's bingo card. And well, DC is still living down this one. Save Martha! The superhero boom is hitting video games as well. Gone are the days of direct film-to-game adaptations that prompted terrible Stan Lee impressions. Excelsior! Enough said. Bob Kane! Now we're in an age where developers and studios are exploring new stories of their own. Some great, and some not so great. So after the blunder of the Square Enix release of Marvel's Avengers, how does their dive into Guardians of the Galaxy hold up? Okay, before we launch into my experience of playing Guardians of the Galaxy, let me provide a, some quick context. See, I grew up a DC kid, and I really got into Marvel much later in life. And when I did get into Marvel, none of those titles included Guardians of the Galaxy. Over time, I have seen all the MCU movies starting from Iron Man, and I like them for what they are. Light popcorn spectacle movies I enjoy in the afternoon when I rarely have anything better to do and which slip from my memory faster than the butter stains on my fleece pullover. This is how I know the Guardians of the Galaxy. Having a prior relationship with the property, either from the movies or the comics under your belt, helps immediately elevate the experience. But if you've been living under a moon rock or your name is Marty Scorsese, Eidos Montreal, the developers of the game, do a great job of easing you into the Guardians universe. Alongside the numerous costumes you can unlock that feature comic book credits, the game is packed with Easter eggs, including a nod to the Marvel Man himself. Enough said. Enough said! Guardians of the Galaxy kicks off with you thrust into this ragtag team of miscreants that would give Prince Hal pause, together with their characterizations intact as they violate galactic law trespassing into a quarantine zone to capture a creature that will reap them short-term financial stability. As you can imagine, this starting point only leads to significantly more trouble that eventually puts the fate of all space at risk. In this instance, the trouble is a fast-growing alien cult that enslaves its adherents with the promise the ability to have an existence free of what sadness and loss one has endured. Except it's all a big lie, like many things we hoped were true. Like trickle-down economics, the Hitler Diaries, and Judd Nelson's career. The story is fun and notably well-structured. The campaign is bulkier than many comparable games in the genre. Established characters and plot points reincorporate themselves back into the narrative, rewarding the player for paying attention. Without giving too much away, Guardians of the Galaxy constantly manages to surprise you in creative narrative ways and pays off a number of its setups. Unlike this. Shouldn't we have a league of our own? While such a straightforward narrative device is standard fare in summer blockbusters, it's worth noting that it's pretty unusual to be found in games. Too often, the story is just a daisy chain of loosely sensical events to explain away why you're in the current level, ultimately robbing the game of any dramatic interest. Like anything with Judge Dredd co-star Rob Schneider. This attention to story flow is essential to Guardians of the Galaxy, as it is a clear-cut single-player game. No open world, no side quests, no annoying crafting mechanics I have to learn, no card game that's just made up for the game that I gotta figure out. No, it's just a straightforward experience. Guardians of the Galaxy lives or dies on its story, and it succeeds more than I ever expected with sharp writing that doesn't belabor itself too much on the overused themes of family and loss. One of my biggest concerns leading up to playing this game is that the Guardian Zeitgeist Bar is set so high by the films, I was concerned this game would try too hard to mimic James Gunn style, and it would ultimately lead to awkward and forced comedy for the sake of familiarity. But instead, Eidos Montreal has embraced their own versions of the characters and deliver equal amounts of hilarity and heartbreak. Guardians turns out to be the most directed game experience I've played since The Last of Us Part II, 
but this time, I don't feel like I need to walk around in 2020 to cheer myself up. This success is due in large part to strong characterizations throughout the cast. A particular note is Gamora, played by Kimberly Sue Mary, who deviates the most from their cinematic counterpart, and in my opinion, for the better. While the character is sullen and damaged, she feels more well-rounded with clearer empathy that provides her with the most substantial arc. Drax, played by Brandon Paul Eels, is the comedic heart of the game with laugh-out-loud delivery of the character's signature articulation of the obvious. Demonstrate their lack of fear. It was a proven battle tactic. Katathian warriors often ride into battle completely naked. Keep your pants on. Although it could be used as a distraction. The game also features a cavalcade of fantastic side characters, most of whom I won't mention for the sake of spoilers. But I do want to shout out Cosmo, one of the goodest boys in gaming. I'm not lying when I say that this game's dog and puppy mocap made my day. This telekinetic commie canine can call me capitalist scum any day. In Soviet Russia, Cosmo would not trust words of capitalist scum. I guess Command & Conquer Tim Curry was wrong. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! But it's John McLaren as Peter Quill that has the hardest lift. As Star-Lord looks, sounds, and behaves differently enough from Chris Pratt's memorable performance, yet he was close enough as well to cause initial dissonance, but eventually settles into his own rhythm that this version now stands on its own and ceased my comparisons. This is important as Quill is the only character you play as, and through numerous dialogue choices, try to maintain some semblance of harmony throughout your strident crew. Unlike many dialogue tree games, the choices in Guardians break away from the clear binary games like Mass Effect. Here it's sometimes between glib and earnest, trying to stall for time or outright lying, like a Zoom meeting, but in space. The results can be significant, with battles ending before they start or framing character decisions later in a different light. Like much of the game, they're not ponderous moments that cause anguish as a conventionally bad decision can turn out to be more entertaining. While it's easy to go for the safe, best choice, I often found myself asking, what would Star-Lord do? And for the sake of interesting character moments, I would choose the selfish or goofier choices. Oh, uh, hey there. Is this thing on? One note before yammering on about the combat. Many people, myself included, were surprised and potentially disappointed that Guardians only had you playing as Quill. Having now finished the game, I do believe that this was the right decision. Eidos Montreal is best known for the resurrection of the Deus Ex franchise, and this single playable character approach is within their DNA. Moreover, Quill is the only character whose personality is malleable enough to change his mind. To play multiple characters in this type of game would almost certainly weaken the narrative and undermine the integrity of the characters themselves, to the extent that anamorphic trees and urban pests have integrity. Well more than a Karen in Central Park. Okay, combat is the other half of Guardians of the Galaxy. It's an enjoyable, if messy, affair. Every character plays in most normal combat scenarios and has a catalog of moves that can be unlocked as you progress throughout the game, either through expending ability points or when the narrative deems it necessary. As Quill, you have command over your skills and blasters in addition to your squad, and I found that calling out commands to your teammates is about 70% of the encounters. It is pretty reminiscent of that of the later Mass Effects and even Dragon Age Inquisition, where you're simply waiting for the cooldown meter to expire before rapidly button mashing again. The game rewards you for mixing up combos, and with more skills, they link together nicely, if unsurprisingly. But in regard to combat, one standout aspect of Guardians are the difficulty options. Yes, you can play with the standard difficulty lineup, or you can get creative with each aspect of the gameplay. Like having Peter Quill do medium damage to enemies, but allowing for lower shield regeneration for an added challenge. You can even customize how long the delay time is between your teammates' commands. But as the game progresses and you fight more and more enemies at once, the rougher edges become more evident. 
If you are playing on a normal or harder base difficulty without any customizations, memorizing the 16 different abilities between your Guardians and where they are configuration-wise is almost essential due to those levels' limited cooldown times. And visually, it becomes hysterical enough that you can't appreciate much about your decisions. It does manage to hide the jarring pop-in of characters that have been called forth from one end of the combat space to the exact opposite end. They suddenly appear in your field of vision like a bunch of underpaid college BFA theater graduates working a Halloween horror night. <coughs> One clever device in combat is the huddle mechanic, where your teammates articulate their collective state of mind and, if you provide a good pep talk, everyone returns to combat healed and buffed. These buffs are then accented by a song from Peter Quill's playlist, so it can be incredibly hilarious when you're suddenly blasting down enemies to a Rickroll. This and the relatively straightforward combat really underscore how this game wants you to proceed at a good pace and see all the story that it has to offer without dragging you down with repetition from repeated deaths. Boss battles and encounters with fewer but powerful enemies are more satisfying and test your understanding of how specific skills work together. All in all, most battles overstay their welcome, but they are interspersed throughout the game at well-thought-out intervals that it never becomes a drag on the proceedings. Those proceedings have some degree of variety as well. Puzzles that utilize the Guardian's various strengths, slalom sequences, and space combat are peppered throughout in a slick package which, on the PS5, has some impressive lighting effects that mitigated some of the qualities of this cross-generational title. Then there's the soundtrack, which is primarily a collection of mid-80s anthems that are not among the best of the era, but definitely the most memorable. Now, for people my age, and if you are my age and you don't need me to tell you my age, I have a small warning. Hearing some of these songs that I have not willingly sought out in all of forever had a strange effect on me. Like, I remember kissing someone to this song, or I remember someone breaking up to me to this song, and I will never drink peach schnapps ever, ever again, I promise. Well, when that happens, it's more than likely you're going to miss out on some key dialogue or objectives. Meanwhile, our producer told me that she was introduced to these songs by her father via the oldies radio station that played in the car when he dropped her off at middle school, which makes me feel just great about this whole age thing. Ultimately, having these iconic songs in-game is an entertaining choice, but it's a nightmare for streaming or sharing the game with audio, which is a bit of a shame. Licensed music can bring a colorful component to video games, from the radios in Vice City to the vintage tunes of the Fallout universe. Licensed music can help shape a gaming experience. So since we can't show you these musical moments exactly as they are, please enjoy some of them paired with our unlicensed, but definitely appropriate for the scene music. It is wonderfully refreshing to play a game that knows what it is and knows what it's doing. Honestly, before I got my hands on Guardians, I thought that this would be the nail in the Square Enix coffin for any future Marvel games. But if anything, it showed me what a wonderful on-the-rails narrative experience Marvel games can be. I doubt Marvel will ever find itself in a one-studio exclusivity situation like EA and Star Wars, but I can definitely see Marvel giving Square Enix further chances with future properties. And speaking of the future of Marvel games, I'm even more curious about the upcoming titles from Insomniac announced earlier this year. No doubt, Spider-Man 2 will be packed with all of the goodness from the last two games, but hopefully Wolverine will follow in the same linear tracks that Guardians has paved. Logan deserves a truly great game, and very few, if any, collectibles. Now it's time to treat yourself to the top five superheroes who deserve to save the galaxy. You deserve it. Thirst Quenched by Dr. Pepper. Number one, Lockjaw. Human superheroes are played out. The Inhumans' bestest boy, Lockjaw, has it all. He's a dog, he's the size of a Mini Cooper, and he has a weird glowing thing sprouting out of his forehead like when you let a potato sit on the counter too long. Also, he can instantly teleport across space, dimensions, and occasionally time, depending on how the Marvel writers felt that day. Sit, 
Shake. Save all of creation. Good boy, Lockjaw. Number two, Shamrock. Superman may be infinitely strong, but no power is more OP in a cosmic showdown than luck. Shamrock has the most Irish power of all. Impossible luck powered by an extremely depressing backstory. Shamrock is a psychic vessel for the souls of innocent war victims, who protect her by manifesting insane lucky breaks whenever she needs them. It's like winning the lottery with dead people. Number three, Phone Ranger. Fine, I admit it, this is a stretch. But seriously, look at Phone Ranger's costume. He deserves a shot at Thanos just for having the audacity to wear that publicly. And his power, he's really good at fixing phones. That's it. I know it may not be the flashiest power, but a hero with the world's deepest understanding of long distance calls could be very useful when you're a couple galaxies out of network. Number four, Matter Eater Lad. As you'd expect, Matter Eater Lad can eat, well, anything. And it's not like that one kid from middle school who would eat anything for a nickel either. Matter Eater Lad comes from an alien race whose jaws, teeth, and stomachs evolved over time to quite literally consume any object ever. You see a wrench, Matter Eater Lad sees breakfast. You see a fire truck, Matter Eater Lad sees lunch. You see an indestructible doomsday device capable of destroying the universe and, well, you see where I'm going with this. Sure, his powers can seem one note at first, but at the end of the day, who else would you want saving the galaxy than someone who can binge their way through any bind? And speaking of seemingly one note heroes. Number five, One Punch Man. Not only is One Punch Man wildly overpowered, it would legitimately be fun to watch Saitama wander around any superhero universe casually one-shotting big bads with a wake of massive collateral damage. In his own series, Saitama has mostly stuck to defending his home planet, but he did hang out on the moon no problem, so space should be fine. Yes, it would diffuse a lot of tension knowing Saitama can one-punch most franchises' main villains. But who doesn't want to see Jim Carrey's Riddler get blasted to pieces by the awesome force of consecutive normal punches? Or is that just me? Sorry, Batman Forever was the in-flight movie on every flight I took in 1996, and I still can't forget. And don't forget to treat yourself to an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. Guardians of the Galaxy is a surprisingly fun, professionally polished, excellently paced, story-driven game that, like the Marvel movies that it's pulling from, doesn't aspire to heights it can't reach. What it does, it does very well, which is entertain and distract. It is a game that succeeds by being narrative first, gameplay second. You don't watch a Guardians of the Galaxy movie for insane or beautiful fight choreography. You go for the found family story, and Idas Montreal delivers this on the interactive level only video games can provide. So while it may fade from memory, like just about everything from the MCU does for me, that doesn't mean I will regret the afternoons I gave over to it. Before we wrap this out, let us know in the comments below what Marvel character you think deserves a game. And if you say Moon Knight, let me know how the hell you would play that game. Now, while you're down there making the comment, make sure to hit the subscribe button. That way we can pester you constantly whenever there's a new review or any type of video. Also, if you like this one, go check out my thoughts on another Interstellar Odyssey, and that is the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Or if you want to get worked up into a froth, check out my review on Metroid Dread. All right, now a lot of you are probably saying, Adam, what kind of score would you give this game? And I would say, I am great.